Here's one of those monologues that incidentally was later turned into a BAFTA-winning short film. Rothko woofed. He was sitting in the armchair again. Occasionally he looked at the telly. Mostly he was looking at me looking at the telly. Rothko didn't want me there. There in Imogen's house that I was supposed to be looking after. I looked at him now. A big Irish wolfhound. Deep, dark eyes. In one I could see Imogen telling me to take him for walks but not to let him off the lead as he hadn't been squirrel trained. And in the other I saw me saying yes and don't lose the keys like you did last time you worthless little prick. God your mother hates you. My brother was there over my shoulder for that bit. I double locked the front door and looked at the keys. What shall we do with these? I said to Rothko. He looked quizzical. Probably better to leave them safe in there, isn't it? I said and posted them back through the door. Now don't lose the dog. I made a noose with the hand end of the lead and looped it round my own neck. I had to stoop slightly, but I figured the knob of my head would stop us ever becoming separated. So we clattered to the park, Rothko galloping ahead, me stumbling behind like a bear running too fast down a hill. Twenty yards into the park, Rothko glimpsed the duck pond and bolted. I landed in the shallows as Rothko closed his jaws on the nearest mallard. He shook his head violently so its quacks were broken like the honks of a goose in a cement mixer. A little girl was crying, help the ducky. I dripped stupidly. The girl's dad grabbed the duck and slapped at the dog's nose, whimpering, stop it, and this is appalling. He was clearly the sort of sensitive man that Rothko had no respect for. They separated with a splash, and so did the duck. The man stared dumbly at the legs in his hand, and suddenly everyone was screaming RSPCA at me. The lead snapped tight around my neck as Rothko dodged a blow, and the world became purple and banging. Through the rumble, I could hear my own strangled peanut of a voice screeching, No, no, please, it's the dog, and it's not mine, it's Imogen Edwards's. Rothko turned to me with curled lips. Imogen's not going to be happy with you at all, he said. Before I had time to gawp, he flew past me towards the park gate. Leg it, you fat fuck, he laughed. I followed in an anoxic blaze. People were running after us. A bus was pulling off 20 yards from the gate. I overtook the dog and launched us into the old lady's please section. He leapt onto the seat beside me. What the fuck is this, he said. I only go in taxis. You can't expect me to look after your legal case in these conditions. Legal case, I said. He eyed me directly. Just think about all the things that you've been doing wrong. Someone's got to defend them. A tiny electric fugue of panic. I began to recall the time when I was seven and a gerbil had started swearing at me. Amongst other things, it had told me that my dad was having an affair. I had told my mum, and soon afterwards the family had split up. Are you the gerbil? I said. Now you're losing it, he replied. Yes, said the conductor. I had no money. Ask him if we can pay on account, said Rothko. Can we pay on account? I said. The conductor eyed me suspiciously. Pay your fare now or get off. Tell him you'll only pay if he can prove you will definitely get to the next stop, suggested the dog. I did. The conductor looked at me as if his mother had just walked out of my nose. Tell him I'm a lawyer, the dog said. I knew I shouldn't, but I did that too. At the next stop we were shown the pavement. I looked at Rothko. Why are you talking, I said. Dogs don't talk. So why are you asking me, he replied. Don't try to be clever, I said. No, I am being clever. Well, that's ridiculous, I said, because you're only a dog. Well, if I am only a dog, then you should be able to answer my question easily. I know about panic attacks. I know I have to find something very mundane and ordinary to do to talk myself down. Have some tea, said the dog. 
I know that, I know that, I said. The cafe was full of people smoking and eating bacon and eggs. The dog sat down next to me. He turned to me and said, I want a full English breakfast. Stop freaking me out, I muttered. His lip curled with disdain. Get me some fucking breakfast, pickle pants. Then a new voice. Get that dog off my seat. The cafe lady was angry. Tell that fat cow I sit in a seat every day of my life and I'm not shifting now, said the dog. Are you going to get him off? asked the woman more angrily. I'm very sorry, I said. He says he's my lawyer, but I'm still not sure. However, I don't want to risk throwing my lawyer onto the floor, bearing in mind the number of things I've done wrong. She glowered. I felt a situation happening, but I didn't know where it was coming from. Um, are you angry with me because he just called you a fat cow? I said. In the street, Rothko called me a hapless tit. He told me he had an empty stomach and was now unlikely to get a single detail of my case correct. I said I didn't care because since I'd known he was my lawyer, things had only got worse. Our bickering turned to swearing as we levelled with the church gate. A family was getting out of a car. Rothko cheered up when he saw this. That little girl has got a snotty hanky in her pocket, he said, and tugged me towards her. Why couldn't I control anything? The little girl squeaked with delight as Rothko stuck his nose in her pocket. Her mother patted him on the head and asked me how old he was. The dog said he was five. He says he's five, but in fact he's seven, I said. The mother looked at me and decided I was joking. Rothko rooted for the hanky, but the pocket was small. Sorry about him, I said. He's not a very good dog, but he's an even worse lawyer. The father smiled politely and urged them towards the church. Leave them now, I said. The little girl turned back. Rothko made to follow. Look, if you don't stop this now, you're fired, I shouted. The family were looking at me now. I knew it was bad for people to see me threatening to sack a dog. So I repeated myself, but this time in dog language. The father shook his head sadly and whisked his family inside. It was a christening. The tissue girl and her parents had joined the others round the font. A priest was holding a baby over the water and the baby was shrieking like ripping metal. I can do that, said Rothko, and began to howl idiotically. Shh, I said, and tried to hide it with a cough. Is there a problem back there? asked the priest. A fat drumming now in my skull cheeks. You're ruining this christening, I said. It's not me, it's you, said the dog. What? Well, I only came in here so you could seek forgiveness from God. What for? For what you're about to do, said the dog and looked me straight in the eye. I felt sick as diesel. Is something wrong, said the priest. Say there is, said the dog. There is, I mumbled. All eyes turned to me. What? Hot iron in my nose. Look at the baby, said the dog. I looked at the baby. Its head swiveled towards me. Then it screamed. Tell them my mother is a whore and the priest fiddles with children. Oh, now look what you've done, I said to the dog. I've seen his note, said the dog. It's true, you must tell them. What's the problem, said the priest. Ball lightning in my stomach, the baby still staring at me. Go on. You rummaged the kid's pants and she receives the cocks of paying men. The priest's mouth fell open. The baby said, sucker. Its father started towards me. The baby told me, I stammered. Rothko lurched towards the little girl who was waving her tissue. The baby's father grabbed me by the neck. The dog leapt. The girl's mother plucked her from the floor and the dog clattered into the priest, knocking the baby from his hands. The baby's mother screamed. The father released my neck and spun towards his wife. I looked at the dog. Ha ha, you're doing all this. He laughed and grabbed the tissue from the girl's hand. The baby was still in the air. I looked at the dog again. What the fuck do I do now? Don't ask me, I'm only a dog, said the dog and pelted down the nave through
through the porch, down the path and straight into the road where he slapped into a van, staggered around and fell over. Manic birdsong. I dropped to my knees in the road. Blood oozed from his mouth. I can't defend you now, you know, he said. Sparrows singing the Diaz Irae. Could you recommend someone, I asked. Try the baby. Really? Oh yes, he said, and smiled. Then he went quite quiet and still. I managed to crawl back to Imogen's house. The baby had not been much use, but its father had given some advice to the soft tissues in my face and groin. I lay outside her front door and wondered what to do. The best thing will be to write a note, I said to myself. I'll write a note and explain everything. My note said, Thanks for Imogen. Sorry about the dog. The duck was in bits. The thing was talking as well, but told me not to say, but I followed it. The cars did it. The keys are in the wrong half. I went away. It's all right, please. Rothko? Rothko? Rothko! I know that's what I wrote because I just found a note in my pocket. Here's another. This one's to me. It's from the dead dog. It's a very angry note. Here's one from the dog's mother now. She's even crosser. I don't go to the park now. The ducks tell everyone things about me. They tell everyone I thought a dog could talk. Shut up, I said when they did, but they didn't. And I hate them now. The duck. That story went on to become a BAFTA-winning short film starring Paddy Considine called My Wrongs, number 8245 to 8249 and 117. Blue Jam is characterised by its weirdness, but as Adrian Sutton explains, it was important to have a degree of familiarity too. If you can put into it elements that are recognisable, but recognisable in a sort of, if you're viewing them, through some kind of dirty window or through some through a kind of lens or kaleidoscope in which elements of the music are kind of recognizable and you, you you're sure you've heard x or y you've, you've heard that somewhere but you can't quite identify from where that's what draws you in it's like a juxtaposition of the familiar and the alien that's what makes it such a rich experience and so we would spend um you know time finding material that had this sound that was you know it sounded faintly like such and such but you, it wasn't quite like something that you recognize and so um we, we went to a lot of a lot of trouble to process material um in that way and just to make it sound dreamy and using things like you know filters and reverbs and a lot of backward stuff but that was the principle is make it half recognizable um so that you think you are somehow engaged but you can't quite locate yourself. That's what um, really supports and contributes to the whole aesthetic of the show. Chris Morris described Blue Jam to a cast member as a spooky, woozy kind of thing. David Quantic again. One thing where Chris does stand out is the way that he writes and the way that he talks, this bizarre kind of ornate mixture of nonsense and enormous vocabulary. It's like if someone had slapped Will Self to make him function more properly. And Chris is a surrealist, which I like, because so much newsbound humour is entirely based on you knowing the name of the Secretary of State for Social Affairs. Whereas Chris's comedy is not even normal surrealism, it's surreal surrealism. It's very strange. I can, of course, not think of an example, but he, essentially, he sets up a situation where something bizarre has happened, but not in the Monty Python traditional way where it's just silly. 
Chris's surrealism isn't silly. It's often very, very dark. The most famous example is, of course, the Blue Jam sketch about the parents whose child has clearly been abducted and they're not really getting round to reporting it. And that's daft and silly, but because it's about the abduction of a child, is a bit different to four Yorkshiremen or the Gumbies, say.